all the German weapons of the Second World War, perhaps none was more feared by the Allies than the dreaded 88. A deadly accurate piece of anti-aircraft artillery, the 88 was also used very effectively in a ground artillery role and in a direct fire role as one of the most effective anti-tank weapons of the war. So effective that it was essentially adapted to an armored chassis to become the mighty Tiger tank. The 88 was produced in the tens of thousands in different models. It was used on all fronts and it was such an important piece of technology that it was a critical part of some important turning points in the war. So today on the History Guy we're going to talk about three stories told from the German perspective that demonstrate the effectiveness of the mighty 88. Stories that deserve to be remembered. It was May 1940 and the Wehrmacht had found stunning success in their attack across the Low Countries, defeating much of the French Army's armor at the battles of Sedan and Montgornet, and was engaged in Operation Sickle Cut, swinging towards the Channel Coast in an effort to cut the Allied front and isolate British, French, and Belgian armies fighting in the north. On the extreme edge of the German advance was the German 7th Panzer Division, under the command of a rising star in the German Army, General Erwin Rommel. On May 21st, the 7th was ordered to wheel around the French city of Arras to seize river crossings over the Scarpe River, bypassing the British garrison at Arras. Having found great success in the campaign so far, Rommel decided on speed. His panzers ran ahead of his infantry, and his flank was exposed. At the same time, the Allies had planned a counterattack under Major General Harold Franklin, using a group that was then called Frank Force. The Allied response at the time was ill-coordinated, and there was some disagreement over the purpose of the counterattack. However, the original goal was rather limited, to relieve the pressure on the garrison at Arras. The attack would include one of the most concentrated attacks by tanks of the British Expeditionary Force in the Battle for France. The force included 58 Mark I and 16 Mark II tanks. The tank, Infantry Mark I, was an oddity. It was small, with a crew of only two and armed only with a machine gun. The design had been nicknamed Matilda by Hugh Ellis, Master General of the Ordnance, owing to its small size and duck-like shape and gait. Despite its small size and limitations, the Matilda had relatively thick armor for a tank in 1940 and proved largely invulnerable to the standard 37mm Pac-36 anti-tank gun used by the German Army in 1940. While its lack of a heavy gun made it essentially toothless against enemy armor, it was effective against infantry, and surprisingly effective against German anti-tank guns and crews. While much smaller in number, the infantry tank Mark II was a much more substantial vehicle, at 25 tons, more than twice the mass of the 11-ton Mark I. Not only was it heavily armored, but it mounted the two-pounder anti-tank gun. It appears that the Allies were operating with limited intelligence, and there is no evidence that they were aware of the particularly vulnerable position of the 7th Panzer Division. However, as historian Karl Heinz Frieser noted in the 2013 book The Blitzkrieg Legend, The 1940 Campaign in the West, accident had it that the British tank attack, mounted without any prior reconnaissance, exactly at the worst moment and in the worst spot, punched full force into the unprotected flank of the German infantry columns. The attack had hit between the 7th Panzer's armor and infantry columns, leaving the infantry without armor, and on a weak flank where they were unsupported. Moreover, the heavy armor of the Matildas proved effective against the German anti-tank weapons. An after-action report by the 7th said of the attack, Our own anti-tank weapons do not have a sufficient effect, even at close range, against the heavy tanks of the English. The enemy simply breaks through the defensive front they form. The British tanks shoot the German anti-tank guns to pieces or crunch over them, and the crews are most likely killed in action. But Rommel did have one weapon that could defeat the heavy British armor, the 8.8 centimeter Flak 18. The Germans had initially fielded an 8.8 centimeter anti-aircraft gun, the Flak, meaning aircraft defense weapon, 16, during the First World War. While technically restricted from developing new weapons after the war by the Treaty of Versailles, the arms manufacturer Krupp was able to skirt the restriction by working through the Swedish firm Bofors, of which they had majority ownership. They had initially designed a 75mm weapon, but had increased its power at the request of the German Air Force. The Flak 18, with various improvements in the Flak 36 and Flak 37, was an extraordinary weapon. Although it could be emplaced in just two and a half minutes, it had a limited ability to fire even from its transport carriage. Its hydropneumatic recoil mechanism allowed it an exceptional rate of fire of 15 to 20 rounds a minute. Its range, combined with an early analog fire control computer, made it deadly against aircraft. But unlike many anti-aircraft guns, the 8.8 centimeter, or 88, could be lowered below horizontal. It was provided with both armored piercing and high-energy anti-tank, or heat, ammunition, 
allowing it to operate both as an anti-aircraft and an anti-tank weapon. The 88 had a fearsome reputation. Historian Paul Fussell wrote in his 1989 book The Real War that Allies knew that the greatest single weapon of the war, the atomic bomb accepted, was the German 88mm flat trajectory gun. First tested in combat during the Spanish Civil War, the Flak 18 37 could penetrate an astounding 84 millimeters of armor at a range of 2 kilometers. At Ross, Rommel was able to organize a second line of defense using his 88s. As the British tanks of the offensive entered open terrain, the heavy guns opened up. Tracer noted, They lost two dozen tanks in just a few moments. The 8.8 centimeter guns played a particularly important role, beating this thrust off. Without a clear objective, and not realizing the possibility of achieving a counter-encirclement, Franklin withdrew. His armor was then attacked by German dive bombers while retreating. Around 50 of the 74 tanks used in the attack were destroyed. There has been much discussion about the Battle of Arras, which so shocked the Germans that it played a major role in the German strategic pause that allowed the Allies to fortify the Dunkirk beaches and evacuate the British Expeditionary Force, the miracle at Dunkirk. But the potential had been much larger. The 88 had prevented a disaster for the German army. Field Marshal Gerd von Rudenstedt would later write, A critical moment in the drive came just as my forces had reached the Channel. It was caused by a British counterstroke southward from Arras towards Cambrai on 21 May. For a short time, it was feared that our armored divisions would be cut off before the infantry divisions could come to support them. A year later, on June 22, 1941, the Germans initiated what would become one of the largest and most destructive military campaigns in history with Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. At the spearhead of the invasion was the 6th Panzer Division, under the command of General Erhard Rauss. The 6th was equipped largely with light tanks, the Czech-made Panzer 35T. While the 35T was lightly armored and only mounted a 37mm bank gun, its light weight, good maneuverability, and speed offered an advantage on the muddy and difficult terrain of the Eastern Front. While German anti-tank guns have been upgraded since 1940, only a few of the 6th Army's anti-tank platoons have been issued the new 5cm Pac-38, and most still use the 37mm Pac-36. But the divisions had been assigned a battalion of anti-aircraft guns, which included 88s. Rouse, with his division out in front of most of the German army, would face a new threat in the east. Behemoths of the battlefield, the massive Soviet Klement Voroshilov, or KV, super heavy tank. Named after Soviet defense commissar Klement Voroshilov, the KV was so heavy that historian David Glanz wrote in his 1998 book, When Titans Clashed, that the KV was invulnerable to almost any German weapon except the 8.8 centimeter Flak. When an infantry battalion tried to stop a Russian advance across a river, Rouse wrote that even the concentrated fire of the artillery and all other heavy weapons the troops possessed did not stop the steel pachyderms. Even the heaviest tanks of the division, the Panzer IV, hammered against the steel giants, but the effort to destroy them was made in vain. There was a real threat to the division, Rouse explained. As it became clear that no weapon possessed by the group was a match for the Russian monster tanks, the danger of a general panic became imminent. The only defense seemed to be the division's heaviest artillery pieces. The 100mm field gun could destroy them at close range, along with, of course, the high-velocity, armor-piercing rounds of the 88. As the Soviets began a decisive tank drive with their KV-1s, they were met by fire from the 88s. Rouse wrote, well camouflaged and sighted in staggering positions, these weapons quickly destroyed a number of Soviet tanks and brought their attack to a standstill. The 88 had again saved the German army from Allied tanks, but that was not the last time that Rouse and his 6th Panzer Division would have to face the KV-1. Only a few days later, Rouse found that his only supply line was blocked by a KV-1. Efforts to circumvent the monster proved futile due to terrain, and the single tank was preventing resupply as well as blocking Rouse from getting his wounded to his aid station. An attempt to surround the tank and attack from all sides with the 50mm anti-tank guns proved futile, and several guns were disabled by the tank. Later, the Germans would see that even these new anti-tank guns left only a blue mark on the massive KV-1. Rouse attempted to bring up an 88, but the crew was seen by the tank, which scored a hit before the gun could be employed, destroying it. Rouse then had engineers sneak to the tank during the night, pack it with anti-tank explosives. The explosion was large, but the effect was small, leaving what was described as a slight dent. The tank remained parked on his only line of supply. Finally, Rouse had his light tanks harass the tank, their guns being entirely ineffective, but keeping the tank crew's attention as they tried to manage a shot against the nimble 35Ts. While the crew was distracted, the Germans were able to sneak from behind 
and in place. An 88. The 88 hit the KV-1 in the rear, but didn't knock it out. The turret started to rotate to the 88, and the crew fired twice. The high rate of fire of the 88 serving them well. The tank stopped moving, but they shot it another four times, for good measure. As the Germans came up to inspect the tank, they found that out of the seven hits on the back of the massive tank, only two had penetrated the armor. Five had only left dents. Then, suddenly, the turret started moving again. While the 88 had knocked two holes in the tank, the crew had merely been stunned. The Germans quickly threw hand grenades into one of the holes created by the 88, killing the crew. The mighty 88 had won the day, but only just barely. It was June 18, 1944, and Colonel Hans von Luck, commander of the 125th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, was in a difficult position. A massive British artillery barrage had devastated his defensive positions in the night. The Allies were unleashing Operation Goodwood, a, a massive attack intended to break out of the Normandy beachhead, which included three British armored divisions, the largest tank battle in the history of the British Army. As von Luch rushed to survey the situation in the morning, he already found British tanks had broken through his lines. He had no idea what force he could bring to bear to stop them when, driving through the city of Cagny, he came upon four Flak 88s, a crew from the Luftwaffe, the Air Force, assigned to defend the city from air attack. Quickly, von Luch pressed them into service. When the battery commander refused, telling von Luch, fighting tanks is your job, I'm the Luftwaffe, von Luch threatened to shoot him, saying, either you're a dead man or you earn yourself a medal. Von Luck had them deploy in an apple orchard near the village. It was an effective position. Later, when Von Luck returned, he described the scene. The 8.8 centimeter cannons were firing, one shot after another. You could see the shots flying through the corn like torpedoes. In the extensive cornfields to the north of the village stood at least 40 British tanks, on fire or shot up. A British major, who would befriend Von Luck after the war, said, When we got about a thousand meters from the villages on the hills, we came under concentrated fire from 88s. Within seconds, about 15 of our tanks were stationary or on fire. By late afternoon, I had only a few tanks left that were still intact. We had to break off our advance and withdraw. Despite initial successes by the British, the Germans contained the offensive. Of course, wars are not generally won by a single weapon system, and clearly the vaunted 88 was not enough to protect the German military from finally being defeated. But it was one of the exceptional weapons of the war. During the war, a tanker wrote to the Chrysler Corporation, which had built his M4 medium Sherman tank, and said that the 88 went through the American tanks just like they were a piece of paper. More than 21,000 of the 8.8 centimeter flat guns were produced during the war, and they were a real threat to the hubris of American industrial might. Paul Fussell wrote of them, frankly, the Allies had nothing as good, despite one of them designating themselves as the world's greatest industrial power. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs>